series of uh, talks. Um, the first speaker is Scott Morrison, and he will tell us on progress on fusion Thank you. So I have a confession to make. I don't believe in higher categories. I mean, I do, I love higher categories. I mean, with, with Kevin, I wrote a whole paper giving yet another definition of it. But I don't know any examples. I mean, do any of you know of a five category? Do any of you know of a 17 category? I mean, if any of you told me a 17 category, I'm pretty sure that I can just search a new place and change 17 to 19, and I'll have a 19 category. Now, for the low values of n, that's not really true. For 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, I think they really are examples. There are, there are examples of n categories in low dimensions that really uh, sort of, uh, intrinsically involve the geometry of the, of the dimension. And those are the sorts of examples that, that I think are really interesting. And uh, in some sense, this talk is, uh, is all about examples. So, uh, usually when people say things like this, uh, mathematicians don't, don't feel very offended. I mean, we're doing something better than either physics or standpoint. Uh, but this talk is definitely standpoint. Okay? There's, there's not. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's maybe uh, not a whole lot of structure in what we know at this point about, about fusion categories. Um, it is just a, kind of a mess of examples. Uh, but there are little bits that we're beginning to understand, and uh, I want to show you my examples. Okay, so so why study fusion categories in the first place? Well, here are a few uh, a few good reasons. Um, as, uh, as as Sonia pointed out in the talk, a, a fusion category is a is a non-commutative finite group in the sense that if you add the adjective symmetric to a fusion category. Then, it, by uh, by the wing, it's a it's a representation. The representation uh, category of a, of a finite supergroup. So, if you if you like uh, if you like finite groups, then maybe uh, fusion categories are an interesting place to an interesting direction to generalize. Do you really want to say non-commutative finite group? This is sort of the least striking statement you can make. It's yeah, so, but I mean, uh, it's it's non-commutative in the sense of non-commutative geometry, non nominality for the non-commutative measure space. It's, it's the same sense here. Okay. You add a, you add a, uh, I mean, you've got to think about the representation category rather than the group for this to, for that to make any sense. Okay. Uh, then uh, in, uh, in Chris's talk on Monday, uh, he explained that fusion categories are exactly what you want to think about if you care about uh, two plus one dimensional local TFTs, at least with targets in, uh, in intensive categories, the individualizable objects of the, uh, the fusion categories. And then, going back to where I started, not believing in higher categories, fusion categories are the very first place where we can study higher categories. There's something higher about them, but they're just as easy as possible. Everything is as nice as we could possibly imagine. And uh, if we want to make some progress on understanding what things look like, maybe this is a nice world to, uh, to, to study. Okay, so uh, what is a fusion category? Happily, uh, a few people have already said this in, in talks uh, earlier in the week, but I'll just say it again. Just a semi-simple tensor category. We're here. Uh, tensor means, as in Chris's talk, uh, abelian and rigid vector spaces, uh, monoidal and rigid, and importantly, with, uh, with only finite and many simple objects. Now, to make life easier, since I'm not really trying to, to understand all fusion categories, I'm just trying to understand examples for now. Let's just make life easy in a few, in a few additional ways. Conjecturally, all fusion categories are pivotal. The, the double dual functor is, uh, is equivalent to, to the identity. Uh, so let's just pretend that's the case. So whenever I say fusion category, maybe to, to make the statement true, you might have to keep the words pivotal fusion category. And I'll also be happy a few points along the way to just say that we're only interested in unitary fusion categories as well. Okay. So let's start with, uh, with an example. Uh, I guess one that's not a finite group, just to be very explicit. So here's uh, the golden category. Uh, it's a very nice one. Uh, it's two simple objects, which we can call iota and tau here. <coughs> objects in fusion categories have, have dimensions, and these ones have dimensions 1 and the golden ratio. And the Grödinger ring is very simple. 
the, the tensor square of the, of the tau object is just the trivial plus another copy of the tau. So in particular, that means we've got some map from tau tensor tau to tau. And so let's draw that, draw that map as a little trigonal vertex. It turns out that it makes sense to draw that as a trigonal vertex in the sense that it's uh, rotationally symmetric. If you take that map and twist it around, you really do get itself back. So it's, it's reasonable to draw it as a trigonal vertex. And now, uh, everything in the category is really generated by this morphism. That is, if you have any morphism in this category, say from the nth tensor power of tau to the mth tensor power of tau, we can represent that as some linear combination of planar trivalent graphs where there are n boundary points on the bottom of the graph and m boundary points on the top of the graph. And in fact, we can completely describe the category in terms of those linear combinations of planar trivalent graphs because there are just these three relations uh, satisfied by those planar trivalent graphs. Uh, the circle can be removed for some value, any time you see a lollipop, you get zero. And then there's some relation that lets you change i's for h's. Uh, in exchange for some, some uh, with the addition of some lower order Okay, so this little diagrammatic description completely tells you what category you're looking at. There's nothing more to say. It's just the category of these, these diagrams, tensor products, taking them sideways, compositions, stacking them on top of each other. And, and this category, of course, comes from somewhere. It's the representations of UQSL2 and the tension of unity, semi simplified. But this is obviously a whole lot simpler. And you can just give this definition. You don't need to mention it to all the modules or anything like that. So there's an example. So what do fusion categories look like? Well, I mean, as I think you've probably guessed by now, I'm not really going to answer what do they look like for sort of, in any reasonable sense. That I'm not going to tell you the structure theory of fusion categories or how you build them out of, out, of, uh, out of simple building blocks. We're just going to look at examples. But to begin with, the obvious examples of fusion categories are the representations of any finite group, or the semi-simplified representation theory of, uh, of a UQG out of UQG. Uh, but there's, uh, there's a lot more uh, out of the world of fusion categories besides examples coming from those two places <coughs> uh, and nearby places. And one of the kind of fun things is that we've discovered, I don't know, you might call them sporadic fusion categories. Uh, which have, have come up uh, during attempts to classify small index subfactors. I'll come back to what subfactors have to do with the subject in just a second. But let me just uh, mention the names of some of the examples. So here the, there's the hard group, the Seda hard group, and the extended hard group fusion categories. And I've drawn a little diagram to, to represent this. Let me, since the diagram will come again later, let me just briefly tell you what it means. That picture on the left there, well, these pictures are, are principal graphs of these fusion categories. So here when we uh, when we draw this graph, we mean that this vertex corresponds to the trivial object in the, in the fusion category. And we've got some special chosen object which we're thinking of generating in the fusion category x here. And now the edges just tell you the tensor product multiplicities. So the fact that out of this vertex, there's an edge back to 1, and an edge to x itself, and an edge to these guys, maybe p and q. That's telling you that x, tensor x, is isomorphic to 1 plus x plus p plus q. And then similarly here, uh, you can work out what you find inside p tensor x by looking at all the neighbors of p in this guy. Okay, so it's just encoding a small piece of the, of the future rules of the category uh, that we get to draw. And that's the picture. And it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's a convenient way of talking about which fusion category you're talking about. There's a unique fusion ring extending what you can read off that, uh, off, off that graph. And, and so on. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to the principal graphs later. Yeah. Uh, so, um, does that mean the fusion rules are symmetric, or it means P tensor X and X tensor P might be something else? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm only telling you that this graph is only encoding tensor on the right of something. Uh, with a little, what you might add is a little bit more information to this graph and say these two objects are dual to each other and everything else is self dual. And once I add that information, you also know it's on the left. Okay. So, well, what are these examples that, that have come from subfactors to us good for? Well, 
uh, they, they certainly constrain uh, conjectures that you might make about fusion categories. And an instance of that uh, is this theorem here, that uh, two of these categories, the first one and the, and the last one there, uh, can't be defined over any cyclotomic field. Which is sort of an uh, interesting observation, because all of the examples that, that were on the previous slide, representations of finite groups by Brouwer and quantum groups of groups of unity, sort of by obviousness, are defined over cyclotomic fields. Okay? Uh, but there are fusion categories out there that require you to go further afield. And uh, this is uh, the examples from subfactors. Hope you hope you learn some things. Okay. So these sporadic examples are going to turn up a few times uh, in what follows in the talk, especially this first one, uh, the, the fusion category coming from the hardware subfactor. <coughs> so <coughs> what on earth do subfactors have to do with fusion categories anyway? Well, one thing is that while we're studying fusion categories, it seems sensible uh, to study them up to merger equivalence. So there's sort of, I think, two reasons to do this. One is that if you're interested in the TQFT that comes from, uh, comes from a fusion category, the two and three dimensional part only, to, only sees the merger equivalence class of the fusion category. I mean, a merger equivalence gives you isomorphisms between the derived area vector spaces and, and so on. So, so that's one reason. Uh, but another reason is just that sometimes uh, we discover some fusion category by some means, and then later we work out how to see its whole merger equivalence class, and then we realize that some other category in that merger equivalence class is related to something that we've seen before or somewhere else that was previously mysterious. And it's sort of, it, uh, it often helps us organize things by knowing, uh, knowing the, the merger equivalent categories. Okay. So again, uh, merger equivalence, as we mentioned briefly in an earlier talk, so I'm not going to spend much time going on about what exactly it is, but it's a binomial category uh, between the two fusion categories, C and D, with the property that the, the Deleen takes the products of this binomial category that's dual, uh, in one case the category C, and the other way around the, the category D. Okay, so once we've said that, we can explain uh, what are known subfactors have to do with the subject. I'm going to not even say what a subfactor is, because in some sense this is almost a definition. Uh, the, first of all, given a finite depth subfactor, we obtain a Merida equivalence between two fusion categories. You can look at all of the, uh, the AA bimodules, so A is some Bonhomian algebra, uh, and I don't really mean all of the AA bimodules, but I mean all of the AA bimodules uh, that you can build using B in some kind of simple sense. So that's, that, that's some fusion category. And you can also look at all the BB bimodules. Again, you can build using this inclusion. And that's some other fusion category. And uh, then the, the, a, the collection of AB bimodules, it turns out, is a lot of the equivalence between those two fusion categories on that side. Now, this isn't just a source of examples of fusion categories and merger equivalences between them. It's universal. I mean, every time you have a merger equivalence between fusion categories, as long as everything is unitary, we have to, we have to uh, put, in, put in unitary at this point, then uh, it's, that Merida equivalence between unitary and fusion categories is realized by some, some subfactor. Okay? So if you want to, you've always, this is sort of one way of, of, uh, of realizing fusion categories and Merida equivalences between them as representations of something. Can I take the identity of Merida equivalence? And you can take the identity of Merida equivalence, and this is often a, often a nice thing to do. Uh, given a single fusion category, you get a subfactor in this way. But I guess that is the idea of the equivalence. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that later in the talk. Sorry, are all fusion categories of the type B mod B for a phenomenon? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, in particular, that's a consequence of, uh, of, of uh, the fact that we can take the idea of the equivalence. Yeah, so I realized that I was wondering whether it was good. Okay. So, uh, given that at the moment actually understanding all fusion categories is, completely, uh, is a completely ridiculous goal, we're just going to try and understand, we're, we're going to try and give classifications of small fusion categories for, for various senses of small. And so there, there are a few good ways, uh, I think, to filter fusion categories by size, and these are the four that I'm going to talk about over today. So there's rank, just the number of simple objects in the category. There's, uh, there's the global dimension, which is the, uh, oh sorry, that formula is wrong. 
Um, it's the sum of the squares of the dimensions of the simple objects, not the sum of the dimensions. Uh, and so in the, in the finite group case, the global dimension is just the size of the group. Uh, and so in some sense that it's maybe a, a good notion of the size of the group category. And then, but then there are two other ones that, uh, that I want to talk about as well. You could say that a fusion category is small if it's, uh, if it's generated by some object x, so every object lives inside, every object is a sum and of some tensor power of x. And that, and that, object, that generating object x has small tensor product multiplicities. When you look at x tensor x, it breaks up with a few sum ands, or maybe x tensor x tensor x also breaks up with a few sum ands and so on. And then the final one is that you might think about fusion categories which are generated by an object uh, with small dimension. Okay. So the rest of this talk, I, I want to just sort of show you what we can do uh, in terms of understanding examples organized along these different measures of sets. So the first two uh, range in global dimension. I'm not going to talk about very much because I've contributed nothing to the subjects really. I just want to quickly tell you uh, what the, what's known. So the small ring, uh, we're, we're really pretty primitive at this point. Um, uh, Austria has, has done uh, fusion categories in Mach 2, Mach 3, yes, yes, you pivotal in Mach 3, and then uh, just recently Hannah Larson has done half of the classification of fusion categories of, of rank 4. In the, now, mostly throughout this talk, I, mean, I never care about gradients, I'm just telling you about fusion categories themselves, uh, but I just want to mention that there are often stronger classification results once you see uh, once you see gradient. There's a, a fantastic theorem uh, just recently proved uh, that if you're looking at modular categories, there are only finite many in each rank, which, is a, which was conjectured for a long time. Uh, now we know it. And uh, in terms of concrete examples, in the modular case, we know everything up to rank five. Uh, we know all the weekly integral things up to rank six, and all the integral things up to rank seven. I'll say it anyway. You might remember those in some history. Okay. The other thing that I want to mention about the small rank case uh, are, these, are these new group categories. So uh, the, the first class of the new group categories are ones where there's, there's a finite group worth of invertible objects, objects of dimension one, and then just one additional object in the future. Uh, now, these sort of categories. Um, Izumi and separately Evans and Gannon have studied this and they've shown, they've shown quite a bit. So first of all, if you look at the, the tensor square of x, well, that has to decompose a sum number of copies of x itself and then uh, a sum, uh, a sum of the group of, the, of the, the, the group elements. And they can show that the that coefficient n there either has to be one less than the size of the group or some multiple. Now, at the moment, we know nothing really about the case where n is actually bigger than the size of the group. Uh, it's maybe reasonable to conjecture there's nothing there, but I don't think anyone knows how to show that. But then in the smaller cases, uh, in fact, I guess I left it off the slide, but n equals zero is one case that's, that's in here, and that one is completely understood now. But for n just one smaller than the size of the group, or n equal to the size of the group, we sort of understand the answer in all of these cases. Uh, if you told me the group you're interested in, these guys can write down uh, some system of polynomials that, that is guaranteed to have discretely many solutions, and the fusion categories with that fusion ring uh, can correspond one to one with the, the roots of those polynomials. So, in some sense, that problem is sort of done understanding those guys, but we don't really understand the pattern. Uh, for uh, uh, Evans and Gantt looked at a, at a bunch of small groups, and it seems that there tend to be two categories of this form for, for each small abelian group. But the pattern is a little bit funny, and, uh, and we don't really know exactly what's going on. Then there's another class of fusion categories, um, which I'm going to mention later, which is similar to this one in the sense that there, there aren't many objects besides for a, for a finite group. So here we've got a finite group of invertible objects, and then that many objects again, uh, on which the group is acting freely. So it's just a single orbit of other objects. Uh, and he's given a similar, similar sort of classification. Into this sort of a, if you're really good at solving polynomials, you can understand what categories there are in this form. Okay, so on to the, the next measure of size and, uh, and global dimension. So I want to briefly mention 
all the, the many, many results about the integer global dimension case. Uh, so here, uh, when, it's, uh, when the global dimension is an integer and the factorization is, is easy, then we know that a lot. So when it's p to the n, pq, or pqr, then uh, the category is to group theoretical, so group are equivalent uh, to, a, to a pointed category, so they call omega g. When, uh, when the dimension uh, just has two prime factors, then they're all weakly group theoretical, which basically means that, uh, so there's this notion of extending a fusion category by a finite group, and the weakly group theoretic ones are the, the iterated extensions of the boring uh, fusion category vector spaces by, by a finite group some, some number of times. And then there are some additional results that rely on having a gradient of some form. So in the modular case, some other factorizations, we know everything is actually group theoretical, and then uh, the result that Sonia talked about on Monday is a graded non-degenerate case uh, with the condition on the other dimension. You can see that everything is, is group theoretical. And so the, the ambitious conjecture that I think everyone is aiming for in that direction is just that integer global dimension is the same as weekly group theoretical. Those fusion categories are sort of solely built out of finite group data, uh, and that's sort of different from the genuinely non-group-like non fusion categories. Okay, so in the integer global dimension case, we know tons of stuff now, although obviously we'd like to know a lot more. But in the non-integer case, we essentially just know nothing at all. Okay? And uh, I think a, a, a nice way to illustrate this is to tell you guys about the finite group game and then to try and play the fusion category game quickly. So the finite group game is a fun game that you can, you can get your graduate students to play with each other or you can play or something. So we just take turns and the idea is that uh, when, uh, on each turn we, you name a finite group and if at any point I can name a finite group that's smaller than a finite group that, that you've named, then I will. Okay? So, uh, so let's play this really quickly. Okay, but we'll play the fusion category game. Okay? So I'll start with vector spaces, the, the trivial group, the, the trivial fusion category. So I'm going to tell me uh, the, next the next fusion category. Group FMC2. Group FMC2, great, okay. Um, uh, so I guess I'll say, I'll, I'll remember the doing fusion categories and remember that there's one with a non-trivial associated to, so that can be my one. Group FMC2 yeah, with a non-trivial associated Does someone else want to play? Group FMC3, okay. And then I'll, there's a few more things like Rep of Z3, there's, there's things with non trivial associators. And then what next? What comes after those bits? Uh, yeah, the Fibonacci category, good. People are, people are on their toes. The, the golden category that I said at the beginning just has two objects with dimensions one and the golden ratio. Uh, the golden ratio is squared, is one plus the golden ratio. So the global dimension is two plus the golden ratio, which is three and a half. So, okay, so we're going to say that one. Uh, and this, I guess, there's, if we're not doing the unitary case, there's probably something um, got contribute to that. And then we get to do four, and there's a bunch of things at four. Uh, the Ising category, as well as things coming from finite groups. And then we go on and on and on. And then at about seven, uh, everyone would lose because we've got no idea what comes after seven. Uh, and there's uh, uh, and there are non there start to be more and more non-integer things at, at about seven or eight and nine, and we just don't know what's in there. Okay? No, no one's proved any results about. Fusion categories with small global dimension anywhere past about six, uh, which is kind of depressing. I mean, if I if if I if I said that I wanted to understand finite groups, but all the finite groups I knew were sort of smaller than say I don't know S three or S four or something, you'd laugh at me. But uh, that's sort of the situation we're in with fusion categories at the moment. By global dimension, we we're, we're really uh, incredibly ignorant. Uh, so I have a little program that in principle can do this problem. Well, at least. Uh, the growth of the fusion categories with small local dimension, uh, but it's a stupid program, and, uh, and it runs far too slow to actually tell you much of this. So it would be, it would be really nice to make some progress with it. Okay, so uh, I now want to give you some examples of the sorts of theorems one can prove uh, about tensor categ uh, fusion categories with uh, generated by objects of small multiplicity. So here's a, uh, a somewhat strange looking theorem uh, that I guess uh, I proved for the sake of it being useful in, uh, in classifying small index, small index subfactors. But I think it's a sort of illustration of the sort of thing 
that you might prove here. So let's suppose we've got some, uh, some <coughs> pivotal two categories. So we're stepping outside the world of fusion categories. Uh, we're allowing, uh, I mean, you, you can phrase this in terms of multi-fusion categories if you want. Uh, and let's, um, let's say we've got some monomorphism in this two category, x going from, from object A to B. And let's, uh, we need to assume that, it, that the two categories are only going to be semi-simple and pivotal in order to be able to make this argument go. And suppose we know a whole lot about the, te the, the tensor product multiplicities of this object X. So first of all, uh, we can look at X X dual, so that's some one morphism from A to A, and that's going to, we're saying that splits up as a, uh, as a direct sum of two simple one morphisms, one and one. <laughs> So this is what uh, this graph is encoding all of this tensor product multiplicities I'm writing up there. Uh, the edges here correspond to tensor on the right with x, and then all, and then tensor on the right with x dual, and then tensor on the right with x, and so on. So it, it tells you uh, if you start at an even depth vertex, the neighbors are what you get by tensoring with x, and if you start at an odd depth vertex, the neighbors are what you get by tensoring on the right with x. Dual. Okay, so x tensor x dual splits up as one plus y. Uh, y tends to x splits up as x plus z, z tends to x dual splits up as y, and then two things, p and q, and then, uh, oh, so that's a type of there that's just meant to be p tends to x is isomorphic to uh, z tends to p prime up there, and, and q tends to uh, x and z plus, plus q prime. So we've said a whole lot about how the, the, this generating object breaks up in its small tensor balance. Okay. So the thing that you can prove uh, is that there's a, there's a dichotomy. Uh, either uh, when you look at the next step of this principal graph, look at what p prime tends to x dual and q prime tends to x dual look like. Either they have a common sum and, i.e. this graph comes back together in the next step, maybe there's more stuff as well, but the, this comes back together. Or this category you're looking at comes from the hard group sub factor. It's, it's, it's one particular thing. And, uh, the, 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 the proof of this um, is, a, is a little bit strange. Um, let, me, let, me, uh, yeah, let, let me quickly show you roughly what goes on in the proof. Um, So first of all, we have these, these simple one morphisms, uh, P and Q, so they've got dimensions, and so we just need to write down this parameter R, the ratio of the dimensions. Okay. Now, uh, knowing what I told you about the tensor product multiplicities, you can deduce, in fact, that there's an element S in the endomorphisms of X tensor power 4, where I guess really what I mean by X tensor power 4 is X tensor X dual tensor X. Tensor x dual, and you can't tensor, you can't compose it to the salt because we're familiar with it. I don't mean that. Uh, and this element s satisfies a whole bunch of relations. It's a uh, it's a it's a lowest weight rotational eigenvector. So if I draw s as this guy with four strings coming in and four strings coming out, first of all, uh, if I uh, rotate it, that's just some multiple of what I started with. Saying that it's the lowest weight means that if I stick a tap on the boundary anywhere around the egg, I think it's zero. And then it satisfies this quadratic equation uh, relating s squared, s, and, uh, and this particular element with the Jones Hansel eigenvector. Um, that, that's something we can deduce purely from knowing the, the tensor product multiplicities. Well, if you have a, uh, well, uh, that, that sort of non degenerate, semi simple, pivotal two category that, that we had in the hypothesis of the theorem, then you actually can show that, uh, that that category has to embed in this thing called the graph Klinger algebra, which is some purely combinatorial gadget that only depends on the tensor product multiplicities and doesn't depend on the category at all, except for its tensor product multiplicities. And this graph Klinger algebra is essentially, you should think of it as, um, as some tensor category whose morphisms are loops drawn on this graph. So some rule for taking loops on this graph and composing them or taking tensor products of them. Um, and I'm not going to say exactly what the construction is. But 
the guarantee is there's some function from this category that is purely combinatorial and built out of loops on this graph. Okay. So now we uh, use this, this condition on P prime and Q prime. So we notice that if P prime and Q prime, oh, sorry, I should say one more thing. Uh, this element S, this, this two morphism in our two category, under this embedding in the graph planar algebra, is, is sent to some linear combination of loops of length 8 sitting on this graph. Remember, this graph might continue in a really complicated way with the other. Some huge linear combination of loops on the graph. Okay. But if P prime and Q prime don't join up with this depth, then if you think of loops that's of length 8 that start here and at their midpoint, halfway through the loop of length 8, pass through the vertex Q, then they kind of run around this way because there wasn't room to get there. There was no connection between P prime and Q prime. So loops of length 8 passing between P and Q have to stay on the piece of the graph that we know that we know all about. Okay, so all we do is we take all those equations for S that we derived up there, and when we write those in components, that is in terms of these loops on the graph, <coughs> there are many, many equations that those expand out into, and we throw out most of them, the ones that involve any loops that go off the edge of this graph that we know all about, and we only look at the subset of equations that are supported here, and you further into a big gravity basis solver, and you see there are no solutions. Okay? And it's, um, well, sorry, you don't quite see there are no solutions. You see there are no solutions unless the norm of the whole graph is some particular number and using that very easily through the new economy from the hardware of such that. Now, uh, this is a, uh, it's a sort of somewhat brute force proof. We really did at the end just uh, throw everything into a Gribner basis solver and have it say uh, there are no solutions which is a, a little bit unilluminating. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the referee report for, for this, the paper that has this, this uh, result in it is one of my favorite ones I've received because it says something like, the result is fine, but the proof is terrible. It's not the author's fault. The proof is just intrinsically terrible. He tried really hard. And the, the fun thing is that I, I cheated. I mean, I didn't give the proof in the paper. You just throw it all into a group that makes a solver and, and it says there are no solutions because I felt guilty about it. Relying on a, on a sort of twelve-hour Gribner basis computation to say some object doesn't exist. So instead, of what I did is, after I knew there were no solutions, I basically asked the computer, try millions of different ways of solving these equations by hand, and then report the shortest one back to me, and then I throw that that, that, uh, that derivation down in the paper. Of course, it's not very close. Anyway, okay. um, that was meant to just be an example of uh, a sort of result you can prove. Fusion categories with low multiplicities. Here's a, another one of a, of a rather different flavor. So suppose that, uh, again, we're in a, a non degenerate uh, pivotal category. I guess we don't even need fusion uh, in this theorem. And we've got some object x. So that x takes x uh, is 1 plus x plus a plus b. So that's actually just like in the, in the hardware category example. But then we add an extra hypothesis that unfortunately breaks things. Uh, we, we, we also need for this theorem the hypothesis that x tends to x mapping to x is rotationally invariant. That is, if you look at this map from x tends to x and you do that, then this is equal to the original. Uh, and, and that's not true, it turns out, for uh, Okay. So then, what, basically, what we can say is that if you give me upper bounds, on uh, the dimensions of the invariant spaces of tensor powers, I can identify the category for you. So the, the relatively easy theorem is that if uh, the invariant vectors in the fifth tensor power of x is at most 10 dimensional, then x is either, either comes from uh, uqs 3 uq 2 or this, this ABA category, which is a, a subcategory of a free product of temporary categories. Uh, OK, there's that. And then you sort of work some more and try and prove the next theorem along these lines. And what you find is, well, if this, this, uh, the, the dimension of the, the five boxes is 11, but you have controls of the six boxes and there's at most 39 of them, then the category has to come, not exactly from hard work, but some other fusion category in the Maruja equivalence class of hard work. And uh, we were very pleased with this because it, it sort of fitted it, this discovery came very shortly after the discovery of the other, the, the, the Maruja equivalence class of hydro. Uh, so it was nice seeing it turning up in a, in a completely different guise. And again, uh, 
uh, I'm going to just sort of briefly say the idea of the proof here uh, to emphasize that it's not, it's not really a very nice proof, it's kind of brute force. Um, but the, the, the rough idea is that you take two collections, Ri and Si, of planar trivalent graphs with six boundary points. So maybe Ri might, uh, might start with that guy, and then it might have a, a hexagon in it, and so on. Okay? So you take two different collections of 40 of these, and then you build the 40 by 40 matrix of their inner products. Okay? So that's some big 40 by 40 matrix whose entries are a little polyhedra, closed, uh, closed planar trivalent graphs. Okay? So, why, why 40 is that? Uh, 40 is because our hypothesis in the theorem here is that this dimension is at most 39. Yeah. So just a, a little bit more. Okay. So you look at that huge matrix of inner products. So maybe it looks like, like if you glue this diagram to another hexagon, uh, then you'll get this little hexagonal prism. Okay? So this, the matrix of inner products are all these little closed trivalent graphs. And you realize that you can evaluate all of those entries in the matrix in terms of a few of the structure constants of the category. There's just a small list of, of parameters, uh, the uh, some of the structure constants of the category, and you can evaluate all the entries as rational functions in those. Now, since this space was only 39 dimensional, all of these planar trivalent graphs give you invariant vectors, uh, the determinant of this matrix has to vanish, because we just took too many, too many diagrams, and so the determinant, which is some rational function in, in these structure coordinates, vanishes. And you do this with a few different collections of, of carefully chosen 40 diagrams, and uh, you find that the common roots of all of these rational functions uh, is a discrete set, and you completely pin down the structure coefficients of the category that you're looking at. And you know what it was, and there are uh, surprisingly few cases, in fact, just the cases uh, in this theorem. Uh, things coming from quantum groups, that free product, and something coming from that. Now, uh, can I ask you as well? Yeah. But it's all just about the Grotten degree. Do you prove that there's no other Grotten degree? Or you. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. This is about the category. Yeah, we're, we're identifying exactly those categories that have a Grotten degree with this property. But, but, I mean, these conditions here are all just about the Grotten degrees. Yeah. But we're identifying the categorifications. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, that's, that's it for the somewhat brutal theorems about uh, fusion categories with, with objects with small multiplicities. So I just want to uh, conclude by saying a little bit about small index subfactors. So historically, uh, well, classification results for small index subfactors have been further ahead, I think, than classification results for fusion categories with a small object. Um, I guess the, the subject just started earlier, and, uh, and index for subfactors was always, was always important. So uh, Okamianu uh, initially gave the classification of, of subfactors with index less than 4, proper subfactors of index 4, and then Hagar showed that it was possible to go above 4 uh, up to some number 3 plus square root 2. So <coughs> what do classification results for small index subfactors tell us about fusion categories? Well, you can interpret these um, classification results about subfactors uh, as telling you about unitary pivotal two categories that are generated by a small one morphism, small dimension one morphism, with a different source of the target. So this is annoying because for fusion categories we, we, want to, we, we want to care about the case where we've got one morphism with the same source of the target. But uh, subfactor classifications don't directly say anything, say anything about that. Now, this, this gadget, uh, a unitary pivotal two category generated by a one morphism with different source and target, that mouthful is the representation theory of a subfactor, and sort of by a total abuse of the Tanakhian philosophy, a subfactor. Uh, I mean, this category of representation is not a complete invariant of the subfactor, but uh, where sometimes we pretend it is. Okay, so what can you do exactly? Well, any fusion category generated by an object x of dimension d gives you a subfactor uh, of index d squared. Basically, you, you take your, your generating uh, object in the fusion category and sort of artificially think of it as a one morphism in a two category between, different, uh, between a different source and target. Uh, a different way of saying that is you look at the Merida equivalents uh, from the 
Fusion Calendar itself and then pick your, pick your favorite object, uh, pick, your, pick your object X. We'll look at your object X in that memory corpus. Okay, so this is a way of, from a Fusion Calendar, giving us a subfactor. But it's worth remembering that this doesn't actually remember everything about the Fusion Calendar. Uh, it just remembers the adjuvant category, that is, the tensor powers of X tensor X dual and all the operations on, on those. So uh, it's important to remember that if uh, that there might be uh, there might be many different uh, fusion categories, uh, which are extensions of uh, of a fixed category of, of, a, of a fixed category, having that same category as their as, as their adjoint category, uh, but they'll all just be the same subfactor. So we do lose something by going across the subfactor. Okay. So what do we have in terms of classifications of subfactors? So uh, Jones has resolved the index for subfactors. First of all, tells you something about the index, that it's either 4 cosine squared pi over n or greater than 4. And that's something by now that's, that's not very exciting. And we all know that the dimensions of, uh, of objects in fusion categories either look like, in unitary fusion categories at least, look like 2 cosine pi over n when they're bigger than 2. And it's just something about algebraic numbers that gives you that. But uh, the, But still, the classifications look very different below and above 4. So below 4, there's a complete classification in terms of these ADE subfactors, and there's a similar classification that index exactly 4. <coughs> then above 4, there's sort of uh, the terrible subfactors, the non amenable ones, whose representation theory is trivial. Uh, and and uh, as category theorists, we have nothing to say about them whatsoever. But as soon as you're outside the non amenable case, uh, there's actually again a discrete spectrum of possible index values, and so the, sort of the, the, a whole lot of papers put together uh, give you this classification of subfactors with index between four and five. There are just ten of them coming in five closer to eight pairs. There's the three that I talked about earlier: hardware for theta, hardware extended hardware, and then uh, the other two: three, three, one, one, and two, 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 one. We just named after what their principal graphs look like. Uh, and let me say something quickly about each of those. So the hard group subfactor, which we've now seen uh, a bunch of times, it turned up in, in several different classification results, uh, is an instance of one of those near group categories that I talked about at the beginning, one of uh, Izumi's second family of near group categories. So in some sense, we understand it. It's part of a family that we expect is infinite, and we know how to, how to decide if each given member of that infinite family exists or not. The Z1 3. Z1 3. You can see here that um, this fusion category here uh, has three objects with dimension one. Just by the graph symmetry, you know that these guys have the same dimension as the trivial object. So there's, a, there's three objects with dimension one, so they must form a Z13. And then there's three other objects in here. And it turns out when you tensor with, with those invertible guys, it just rotates those middle three. So this is an instance of, uh, of assuming the second family of, of new group fusion galaxies. So in some sense, Hard work now sits in a family and we know what's going on. Uh, the Aceta hard work subfactor for, for a long time was completely mysterious, uh, but just recently, uh, Izumi, along with Grossman and Snyder, uh, did some great stuff where they completely understood the Merida equivalence class of this Aceta hard work subfactor. <coughs> and what they discovered is that sort of way over the fast time in this Merida equivalence class, there was something that unexpectedly looked like something we'd seen before. It's an, uh, uh, yeah, it's another one of, of, uh, of this family that we have utilized in, but now we're doing uh, Z12 plus Z14. So once you realize that you should care about fusion categories only up to meter equivalents, the Seda hardware again sits in a family of things that we understand very well. The extended hardware subfactor uh, is at this point apparently unrelated to anything else in the universe. I don't know what to say about it. The only construction of it is, is brutal. Uh, and then the, the last two categories, are, or the last two subfactors, are pretty simple. Uh, we understand very clearly where they come from. Uh, you can look at um, uh, E6 as a module category over A11, and then look at the, uh, the trivial object in E6, and look at its internal endomorphisms, and that's a model for the, the 3311 subfactor. And then the 2221 subfactor, uh, 2221 category uh, uh, is not quite one of these near group ones, but it's an extension by, by a finite group in a way that we understand okay. So uh, a corollary of, uh, of that 
theorem on, uh, on subfactors with index between 4 and 5, well, it's just this. If you have a, an object in a fusion category with a dimension between 2 and square root 5, then in fact we know exactly what the dimension is. Just going back here, you look at all of these subfactors, and uh, basically, uh, well, it's a, I guess this is a little bit complicated. Uh, the, uh, the first four here do not arise as uh, the, the trivial Mujer equivalents from a fusion category to itself, but this last one does. And so the only way to get a, uh, uh, if you've got a fusion category of dimension d, the corresponding subfactor of dimension d squared, uh, can, you, you, of these five, only this one can turn up in that, in that way. Okay, so that gives you the corollary about dimensions of objects in fusion categories. It turns out there's actually a purely number theoretic proof of this corollary as well that doesn't need anything about subfactors. Okay, we have a few more things that we're trying to do at the moment. Uh, we know it's uh, index five subfactors, and they're all basically coming from group theoretic data. Uh, we have some classifications of one super transitive subfactors. One super transitive just means that x takes your x dual has at least three summands, unlike in this example I had over here. And these ones, the examples that turn out pretty boring, in the sense they come from quantum groups, except for two of them, which are a little bit strange. They look very much, they have the same fusion meaning as things, as some things coming from quantum groups, but they're not graded, they satisfy a grading of the funny phase factors, you do the randomized right three move, uh, and we don't have a good sense of where those fusion categories come from. We only have a, a really nasty construction of them at this point. And it would be lovely, I think, to understand if there's some sort of twisting that changes the gradient that can, that can get those. And then, uh, outside of the one super transitive case, we're pretty hopeful that we can get past five up to five and a quarter, baby steps. But the sad news is that it appears there's nothing new, there's no new subfactors in that next range. Okay. So, this, somehow, the, the summary from, from all these different attempts at classifying small things is that there are surprisingly few new examples at each step as you go a little bit further. Um, because I think at every step we really expect that just around the corner we're going to start seeing tons and tons of examples. <coughs> and it's a little hard to know what that means. Uh, I mean, it's disappointing. Proving classification results saying that there aren't any of something is a little bit, is a little bit sad. Uh, but maybe it makes the few sporadic examples that we have so far even more interesting because they're sitting there by themselves without lots of other stuff around them. On the other hand, it might just be that we're really just looking at the very, very bottom edge of this world of fusion categories, and it's, you shouldn't be so surprised. We haven't seen anything yet. And as I said before, if you only knew about finite groups up to order 12, you wouldn't really know much about finite groups, and we're probably in a very similar situation with fusion categories. So uh, I'll finish with that. My memory of a quote, that, or something that Terry Gannon once said to me, uh, maybe fusion categories are, are like the night sky. And down here at the moment, it looks like it's all just big dark patches in between a few bright stars. But every time we get a new telescope and the ability to zoom in somewhere close, we just see that it's full of stuff. There's zillions of stars out there. And uh, we're only just beginning to get a sense of, uh, of what's there. Okay. Thank you. Hey. Classification results for subfactors uh, really, although um, the, the method of proof barely touches the subfactors somehow and works purely in the representation theory, it really does use unitarity in a, in a quite strong way. And we've, uh, we've tried to sort of rerun the proof here, dropping unitarity, and uh, we can get a little interval above four, but we, we can't get it even close up to five at the moment. Dropping the So, um, so in terms of two categories, everything you talked about has either one object or two objects. And yep. do, you, do you know, um, yeah, how, how much generality is losing? If one cares about the rate equivalence classes of two, two categories, you know, instead of considering five objects. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that we're probably losing lots and lots of detail. I mean, the, this idea that we should look at I mean, several of these measures of size I was talking about, we're looking at fusion categories generated by a single object with some smallness property, and, and there's no reason to think that you should only look at, the, look at fusion categories generated by one object. Uh, and say that, I think that's just not a factor. It's more specifically if one, there might be things that have a really representative with three or more objects that are not equivalent to I'm just wondering if there's some result that you can always Oh, yeah. Four questions.